Greetings. I uh, am speaking today uh, when it's just the day before, it's a Sabbath and it's the day before many uh, nations observe Father's Day. So I'll tell you what they, what might be called a dad joke. A fellow says, I never buy Velco products. It's a ripoff. Uh-huh. Thought you might like that. So for you dads out there, if you happen to be listening to this, around the time of Father's Day, then happy Father's Day to you. And I hope, frankly, that many of you will be hearing this whenever, maybe even years from now. And because some of you are, are regular viewers, you know that if I fumble a bit, I want, or, or even a lot, I, I, I try to correct it. I want to make a couple of comments from last week. But first of all, I want to say, this morning I spoke about the culture of God's church one of the aspects of it is appointed times that God has given to his people to observe, to give us a kind of universal culture within the church. And one scripture that I would like to add would be 1 Corinthians sixteen eight, where Paul refers to uh, Pentecost, uh, to the church at Corinth. And uh, so you can add that if you do happen to watch what I covered this morning at the Flair Church here in Lakeland. And if any of you are in Central Florida, uh, during the next, you know, over the course of the time ahead. Uh, let us know and if you'll be here and want to attend Sabbath services in Lakeland of, of the Flair Church. Uh, you know, the as we say down here, y'all come. Anyway, a couple of uh, corrections I wanted to make. First of all, the uh, Shemini Aseret, the eighth day of sacred assembly, is that. It's an eighth day, which is a sacred assembly. It comes after the seven days of the Festival of Tabernacles. But it is a distinct holy day. It is a distinct holiday, you could say, a distinct festival. And you could see that if you look at Numbers 29 and you look at the sacrificial system. There was a set of sacrifices for the Festival of Tabernacles, a separate one for the, for the next festival. Uh, I also would like to mention, I talked about singing scriptures. And a couple of other thoughts came to mind. I, I remember uh, attending congregations where we sang uh, Matthew uh, 28, some passages from there, and also from John 14. I wanted to add that. In other words, we, you can sing Old Testament scriptures, and of course, uh, you obviously as Christians, we're going to sing uh, New Testament scriptures. Uh, I also wanted to mention that sometimes a person fumbles, and you know he puts the bread on the peanut butter. You know how that goes. So last week I was talking about 1 Kings 22, and I think I mistakenly called it 2 Kings 22, but it's 1 Kings 22. But the, the parallel account is found in Second Chronicles, I think, verse, uh, chapter 20. So I think I'm pretty much caught up. There is one other thing I want to mention, because a couple of times I have referred to an Orthodox Jewish translation of the New Testament, and there is such a thing. I doubt that it was done by people who are still practicing Jews, but evidently it was done by Christians from a, a, that kind of background or, or, or who had very deeply researched it but I can't believe that some of them weren't from that kind of background. It's a very wonderful translation for somebody like me because a lot of, there's a lot of in-speak in it, you know, and I kind of wish I had it back when I was a lot younger, just coming out of the yeshiva and, and reading the New Testament. It would have been interesting to have read that translation, but maybe it's for the best. Uh, you know, maybe now that I, can, I can read it when uh, hopefully I'm more mature spiritually and you know, can uh, get uh, can uh, have a more balanced of approach to it. But uh, I normally, when I speak, I'm using the New King James translation, as you know. And speaking of the New King James translation, let's go to Matthew 16. In Matthew 16, and by the way, that Orthodox Jewish translation is called, I believe, the uh, Orthodox Jewish Brit Chadashah. Uh, Brit Chadashah is the Hebrew for New Testament, and it's available in English, but as I said, there's a lot of in-speak in it, so there's a, a glossary at the end, you know, uh, defining a lot of the terms that are used. All right, in Matthew 16, uh, there in Caesarea Philippi, uh, in the northern part of, uh, of the land of Israel, and uh, the time, at one time that area was called Banyas, and it was uh, part of the tribe of Dan, anciently. Uh, Let's go to verse 13 of Matthew 16. When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, 
Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So they said, Some say John the Baptist. So he had been martyred by then. Some Elijah. And others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Jeremiah was, of course, a very prominent uh, prophet. Uh, and his words, of course, are quoted in the New Testament. And what I want to talk about today is how God's church in the end time is going to, in effect, be reliving the experience of Jeremiah and even going beyond it. So I could call this perhaps in the footsteps of Jeremiah, in the footsteps of Jeremiah. Uh, I want to talk about how Jeremiah was, they, they, they think of him as the weeping prophet often. Uh, we talk about a Jeremiah. We talk about the gloom and doom that he, that he preached, but also he was the prophet of hope. Uh, he was a prophet of encouragement. He did both. He was there to warn his nation of a coming catastrophe. He lived through the catastrophe to the other end, and he had a hand in rebuilding and restoring the nation. Now, he didn't live to see the actual return from captivity, but he did play, he did, he did live to encourage, uh, and he had people with him who helped to keep the nation spiritually on track. So yes, they, they, were, they sinned so badly that they were exiled, but they had spiritual leaders to arouse them to repentance. They had Zephaniah, they had Jeremiah. Uh, at earlier day, days, they had a prophetess, a, a, a woman who was a prophet, uh, uh, Hulda. And uh, they had, uh, uh, Jeremiah was a priest and prophet. There was a younger priest, Ezekiel, he went into captivity with his people. He played an important role. And then, of course, Daniel of the royal family, of Daniel of the tribe of Judah, who practically was running the Chaldean Empire in a way. And uh, he played an important role as well. So these spiritual giants helped to keep the people to some degree, you know, sufficiently on track so there could be a repentance and a restoration. And I want to cover a little bit of the career of Jeremiah now. He was persecuted, he was almost killed, he was ultimately imprisoned by his own people, and he was released by the enemy, which is, which is interesting. The enemy understood more than the people of Judah what was going on, at least one of the commanders which I'm going to, who I'm going to quote later on. So Jeremiah is interesting from the role that he played. As I said, he was the prophet of gloom and doom, and he was the prophet of, of, of uh, hope. He saw the catastrophe of his people, and then he helped to restore his people. Uh, and that is almost implied in his name. When we hear, think about Yirmiyahu, it could mean the eternal ra raises, the eternal exalts. But it could also, uh, in a way, be, relate to the word to throw or to shoot, like as if to cast away. And so what I like to do is use an English uh, pun th that, that fits the, the, the name, to raise... R-A-I-S-E, to raise, and then to raise, R-A-Z-E. You know, so Jeremiah saw his uh, beautiful city, his capital city, and the temple. He saw it raised, you know, destroyed. Uh, but at the same time, uh, he knew that God would raise up his people and, and would restore them. And he is the prophet of the new covenant, Jeremiah 31, verse 31 and beyond speaks of the new covenant. So let's take a look at Jeremiah as we have some time, and then I want to tie it into the role of the church in the end time generation. Now, I'm, I'm not saying that it's literally here, but it wouldn't, it wouldn't, I'd, I would kind of expect that in this century, uh, things will come to a head. And, uh, some, I mean, we're only 22 years into this century. This is 2022. It seems to me anyway, there's a, it's a very good likelihood that in this century, things will finally come to a head. Obviously, I'm not setting dates. <laughs> uh, but anyway, uh, let's go to Jeremiah. The words of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah. I want to skip uh, and mention that his career spans many rulers. Some, uh, one of them was a, the great righteous ruler, Josiah. He, under the influence of the prophetess Hulda, and uh, with Jeremiah, Jeremiah being a contemporary, uh, Josiah led a renewal. But after his death, which Jeremiah mourned, 
uh, the book of uh, Lamentations was probably probably began as a prophecy lamenting the the death of Josiah. I'm not saying it wouldn't be a contemporary account of what happened when Jerusalem fell, but it it probably began as a prophecy following the death of Josiah, and so he 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 was he 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 did he he worked during all the, the career of many many kings, and finally of course the last king of Judah, Zedekiah. Uh, and, and that ended the the, Jude the monarchy of David in terms of ruling in the southern kingdom. You know, so, so just Zedekiah was the last of the Davidic kings to rule over over the house of Judah. Um, I want to go to uh, Jeremiah now, the um, fourth verse of the first chapter. Then the word of the Eternal came to me, saying, "Behold, I form you in the, I formed you in the womb." I knew you before you were born. I say, I uh, let's let's reread it again. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. That's quite something to tell somebody. He's heard this in his younger days. But uh, ah, uh, Lord God, be, behold, I cannot speak for I am a youth. But he did have a long career, <coughs> spanning around, I suppose, around half a century. And he did live a long life, uh, and he did accomplish a great deal. And of course, he had he he is traditionally the author of of Kings, and the Book of Jeremiah and Lamentations. And he had a scribe who worked closely with him. He had a scribe Baruch, uh, the son of Neriah. Uh, so and the scribe was with him uh, for uh, much of his life. Uh, uh, he may have pre he may have died before Jeremiah or. Maybe shortly after, you know, it's murky at that point. But he he it, it, he did accompany him even after the the destruction of Jerusalem down to Egypt, according to something I'm going to read in a moment. So anyway, he's young and he, he it's 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 quite a responsibility. It reminds one of Moses, who was not young, but still felt, you know, how can I do what you're asking me to do when he was 80 years old? Anyway, but the Eternal said to me, "Do not say I am a youth, for you shall go to all." Who, uh, to whom I send you, and whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of their faces, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Eternal. In other words, you you are going to face, you are going to face opposition. He surely did. It was rough. He had a rough rough life as a prophet, at least after Josiah's time, you know. Uh, but God did deliver him through it all. Then the Eternal put forth his hand and touched my mouth, and the Eternal said to me, Behold, I have put my words into your mouth. See, I have this day set you over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out and to pull down, to destroy and throw down, to build and to plant. Oh, to do both. To throw down, you know, as I said earlier. Uh, I'm going to pull a Hebrew Bible off the shelf here and look at Jeremiah 1 and just see uh, what Hebrew term is used. Uh, when he says he wants to throw down, and that's in verse uh, 10. Um, uh, to point and to pull down, to destroy, and to throw down. Uh, it's not it's um, not the same root that I mentioned. Oh, okay, it's various translated to overthrow. But nevertheless, what I said does apply. I do believe there's a play on words in his name. So let's continue now. So as I said, raise and raise. He saw the kingdom raised, and yet he was commissioned to be part of raising it back up again. You know, as I said, that's an English pun, but it does fit, uh, I think, what's implied here. Okay, so see, I have set, I have this day, verse 10, set, uh, set you over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out and to pull down, to destroy and to throw down, to build and to plant. You know, so he, he did both. Now, in Jeremiah 7, we see a very serious condemnation of the nation. And, of course, there are many of them here. Um, I'm going to go to Jeremiah 7, verse 25, just as an example. Obviously, there's so much to this book. You know, what, 52 chapters. Um, since the... I'm in verse 25. Since the day that your father's came out of the land of Egypt until this day. I have ever sent you all my servants, the prophets, daily rising up early and sending them. 
Yet this, yet they did not obey me or incline uh, their ear, but stiffened their neck. They did worse than their fathers. It got worse and worse and worse, I'm saying. Verse 27, therefore you shall speak all these words to them, but they will not obey you. You shall also call to them, but they will not answer you. So you shall say to them, the, uh, this is a nation that does not obey the voice of the Lord their God, nor receive correction. Truth has perished and has been cut off from their mouth. Uh, it, it's hard to even read this without getting very emotional, but I'm going to keep reading. Cut off your hair and cast it away, and take up a lamentation on the desolate heights. For the Lord has rejected and forsaken the generation of his wrath. So it's just cut, cutting off the hair and casting it away is kind of symbolic of how God is viewing that nation. And they were, of course, the chosen people, what was left of the chosen people that still had that identity. For the children of Judah have done evil in my sight, says the Lord. They have set their abominations in the house, which is called by my name to pollute it, polluting the very temple of God. And they have built the high places of Tophet, which is in the valley of the son of Hinnom, and, you know, that became later symbolic of, of uh, the punishment of the wicked, right? The uh, Valley of Hinnom, Gehenna, Gehenna. To burn their sons and their daughters in the fire. Isn't that horrible? Human sacrifice, sacrificing children. To burn their sons and their daughters in the fire, which I did not command, nor did it come into my heart. Of course, God would not require such a thing. Therefore, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when... It will no more be called Tophet or the Valley of Son of Hinnom, but the Valley of Slaughter, Valley of Slaughter, for they will bury in Tophet until there is no room. The corpses of the of this people will be food for the birds of the heavens and for the beasts of the earth, and no one will frighten them away. Then I will cause to cease from the cities of Judah and from the streets of Jerusalem the voice of mirth, the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom, and the voice of the bride, for the land shall be desolate. A well, very, very tragic end, but it wasn't the end. And, and Jeremiah, pardon me, also was a prophet of hope. I want to go to Jeremiah 31, pardon me, in verse 10. Hear the word of the Lord, O nations, and declare it in the isles afar of off, and say, Mizare Yisrael yikapsenu ushimaroche roe edro. He who scattered Israel will gather him and keep him as a shepherd does his flock. And I want to continue on in verse 15. Thus says the Lord, this is going to be a familiar verse to you because the way it is applied in the New Testament. Thus says the Lord, a voice was heard in Ramah, lamentation and bitter weeping, Rachel weeping for her children, uh, re uh, refusing to be comforted for her children because they are no more. Thus says the Lord, refrain your voice from weeping and your eyes from tears, for your work shall be rewarded, says the Lord, and they shall come back from the land of the enemy. There is hope in your future. And uh, this is the inspiration for the poem that has become the national anthem of Israel, Hatigva, the hope. There is hope in your future, says the Lord, that your children, Vishavu Vanam Ligvulam, that your children shall return to their own border. So he's encouraging. And of course, in this same chapter, if you continue on, he speaks of the new covenant. And now as an echo or as a rebuttal to, to Jeremiah 7, Jeremiah 7 was indeed fulfilled. But now we come to Jeremiah uh, 33. And... Um, Let's go to verse 10. Now, there are other verses here that, are, of course, are, apply our messianic prophecies and are very powerful, and you, you could read them from, you know, when you have the opportunity to do so. But I want to go to the 10th verse here. Thus says the Lord again, there shall be heard in, in this place of which you say, it is desolate, without man and without beast. That's what had happened, right? In the cities of Judah, in the streets of Jerusalem, that are desolate, without man and without inhabitant and without beast, the voice of joy and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride, 
the voice of those who will say, praise the eternal of hosts, for the eternal is good, for his mercy endures forever. You know, Psalms. I talked last week about singing Psalms. And of those who will bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. For I will cause the captives of the land to return as at the first, says the Lord. And there was indeed a partial restoration uh, later on in the days of Cyrus. And the nation remained there for quite some time. And the covenant was renewed under Nehemiah. Uh, and as I said, of course, unfortunately, you know, it didn't last. But there is coming an ultimate redemption yet ahead. So these are some of the words of Jeremiah, as I said, the, the condemnation as well as the, uh, as well as the encouragement. Now, a as I said, he wound up imprisoned by his own people, but when his country was, was conquered by the Chaldeans, uh, a commander of the Chaldeans uh, spoke to him. I'm going to jump in in verse 3. Uh, now, now uh, uh, his, his name is... Um, uh, it's mentioned in in verse 40, uh, Nabu Zaradan, just if you want to know the name of the person I'm quoting. Now the Eternal has, uh, I'll go to verse 2, And the captain of the guard took Jeremiah and said to him, The Lord your God has pronounced this doom on this place. He, he knew more than a lot of the Jews, unfortunately. Now the Lord has brought has brought it and has done just as he said, because your people have sinned against the Lord and not obeyed his voice. Therefore, this thing has come upon you. And now look, I free you this day from the chains that were on your hand. If it seems good to you to come with me to Babylon, come, and I will look after you. But if it seems wrong for you to come with me to Babylon, remain here. See, all the land is before you, wherever it seems good and convenient for you to go, go there. And I won't read further, but he did wind up with a group of survivors and there was turmoil uh, and the leader of the group decided to go down to Egypt which was not the right decision uh, but, but uh, nevertheless Jeremiah was with him at the time and I want to read Jeremiah 43 and verse 6 this group that Jeremiah was with because there were, there were some VIPs with the group I want to discuss Jeremiah 43 and verse 6 men women children the king's daughters and every person whom Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, had left with Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, the son of Shaphan. And of course, uh, Gedaliah had been assassinated, as, as if you read earlier. And Jeremiah, the prophet, and Baruch, Baruch, the son of Neriah. So Jeremiah and Baruch were there uh, with uh, Yohanan, with Johanan. Uh, and and uh, you can read in verse 5. Uh, and uh, after the assassination of Gedaliah and after the one who had done it had fled with, with a certain few and the rest were now being protected but they were being brought up down to Egypt and uh, among them were the daughters of Zedekiah now there are some people who believe that Jeremiah uh, took at least one of the daughters of Zedekiah and traveled away with her to a, 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 a faraway land where there was a descendant of Judah ruling and um, he, uh, she married uh, a prince uh, of that land and so descendants of David continued to rule and uh, continue to, to this day to rule that's a subject for another time but it would be interesting if Jeremiah did perform that function but Jeremiah did encourage his people and even in Jeremiah 32 while his country was under siege he bought property in the besieged area to, and, and God said yes people are going to come back here he even as I said we, we bought property during during the siege and um, from uh, so I wanted to to get my train of thought here uh, of, of his encouragement um, yes I want to go to the 25th chapter of Jeremiah and the 12th verse because you see that this encouraged Daniel uh, a, a later uh, leader of the Jewish people who prophesied, although he was not technically a prophet, he was a secular ruler, but he, he certainly is a prophet. Jesus Christ called him one, even though that wasn't the office he occupied, but, uh, you know, Jesus Christ refers to Daniel as a prophet. So I want to go anyway to Jeremiah 25 and verse 12. He talked about the fact that this empire of the Chaldeans would only last 70 years. So the, the, it was a 70-year captivity. 
Then it will come to pass, verse 12, that when 70 years are completed, that I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, the land of the Chaldeans, for their iniquity, says the Lord, and I will make it a perpetual desolation. So 70 years. Now Daniel was there for the, the fulfillment of that, and that inspired him to think, well, now maybe we're going to have the opportunity to go home. And he prayed about it, and very soon afterwards they did. Uh, I'm going to go to Daniel 9. In the first year of Darius, see, this is, the, the Medo-Persian Empire had just taken over. And very soon after that, Cyrus was going to give his decree. But before that, evidently, we have this prayer of Daniel. So now I'm in Daniel 9. In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus of the lineage of the Medes, and this may have been an, a name for Cyaxeres, Cyaxeres the II, Anyway, let's go again. In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus of the lineage of the Medes, <coughs> excuse me, who was uh, made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books the number of the years specified by the word of the, of the Lord through Jeremiah, the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolation of Jerusalem. And so this prompted him to pray and then, of course, God inspired Cyrus, if, as you read, and the Jews did have the opportunity to go back and rebuild the city, the temple, and so on. You know, as we could say, the rest is history. And at the end of the book of Jeremiah, there is some encouragement. Uh, yes, he did lament the book of Lamentations. He did prophesy gloom and doom, but also a, a tremendous encouragement, including the new covenant that he prophesied. But at the end of Jeremiah, and by the way, the same passage is found at the end of Second Kings. Uh, we find, and just to summarize it, that a king of Judah that had been held captive, Jehoiakim, was released from captivity uh, by, the, by the new ruler of, of uh, Babylon. Uh, this was in 561 B.C., about that time. And so evidently Jeremiah was uh, very possibly still alive at that point. Um, let me think. He was, uh, If not, then this would have been added to the book, but it... But um, it does show again that this book is intended to be a book of encouragement. Um, anyway, so let's, let's read it. Uh, well, I'm going to summarize it for, uh, for, uh, and just tell you that Jehoiakim was restored uh, to a very prestigious position. Now, he wasn't sent back home to rule. You know, those days were gone. There were, the Davidic monarchy was gone, but at least he was released and treated well. And so this was, this was uh, encouragement. And, and, and we find it at the end of Second Kings, and we find it at the um, end of um, at the end of the uh, book of uh, of uh, Jeremiah as well, uh, and uh, it it was it's, it is a fitting conclusion to this material because as I said, Jeremiah did look forward to a more positive time, and he, whether or not he lived, I don't know if he lived to see this particular uh, s uh, segment because this comes in five sixty one. And uh, I'm not sure if he was still alive at this point, but evidently this was something added to the book to, to conclude it uh, in, in a very positive way in keeping with the spirit of Jeremiah's prophecies. I want to uh, go now to what I'm thinking is an analogy, a comparison of Jeremiah's career with that of the New Testament church, particularly in the end time. What is the role of the New Testament church? Well, unfortunately, the time is coming when there's going to be a very powerful witness to the world, as there have has been all through the centuries, but particularly powerful right before the second coming of Christ, where the sins of the world are going to be exposed and you know and 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 condemned, and the right way of life expounded, and and the um, results, you know, the consequences revealed. There, you know, we, in other words, we have the good news. But the good news, as you know, as we know, is followed first, is preceded. First, we tell people, all right, there's good news. But first, unfortunately, we have to understand that the world is going to go through the labor pains, you know, the pangs of the Messiah, as the Jews refer to them, because the world is so sinful. You know, there, there's coming a, a great cataclysm, uh, uh, history reaching its climax as the sins mount up and, and punishments come, and God finally intervenes in the most powerful way ever to judge the, this world civilization. That time is coming. But then beyond it is coming, of course, a, a wonderful time. And uh, But the church's responsibility is going to be to talk about that. It will lead to persecution and even ultimately to martyrdom for some. In fact, for many. 
but uh, Jeremiah survives. Of course, the church survives. Uh, in Jerem in uh, Matthew twenty four fourteen. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. So there's going to be a very powerful witness. God, uh, Jesus Christ told his disciples in Acts 1 to go throughout all the world, and of course in Matthew 28 for that matter, you know, and elsewhere, you know, you go through all the world and, and preach the gospel, but particularly right before the end, uh, there's going to be a Jeremiah-like work. Uh, and as I said, it will bring the the unpopularity that Jeremiah brought upon himself. Obviously, there'll be some that will respond. You know, thank God there are many that are going to respond. And then others will maybe not know what to do about it, but at least they'll hear it. And they'll be able to then respond later on when Jesus Christ returns. Uh, and then in Mark 13, uh, in verse 11, I'm going to read it there as well. That same Olivet prophecy. Mark 13, I'm sorry, verse 10. And, this, and the gospel must first be preached to all the nations. So it's going to come to the point in Revelation 12 where a great persecution will come upon the church. The church will have to flee. But evidently, uh, the, uh, the work of the two witnesses will, will uh, of course, continue. And they'll be protected uh, as Jeremiah was protected. The two witnesses will preach. And there will be many converted, but they will not have been they will not have fled. They will be later converts, evidently, and persecution will fall on them, as we see in Revelation twelve seventeen. So there will be persecution and there will be martyrdom. But uh, as Jeremiah, in effect, was one who restored, in effect, the confidence of the people through his encouraging prophecies and perhaps even played a role in preserving the Davidic dynasty. That's more controversial, but he may have done that. But he did encourage his people, and he did give them a, a view of the future and what God would ultimately do. And he did it particularly inspire uh, you know, the, uh, the younger priest Ezekiel and the secular ruler Daniel in, in, in their ministries. And their ministries led to the, re, uh, to the restoration of the people of Judah which prepared the way, of course, for the first coming of Christ. So God's church in the end time will have the opportunity, to, you know, the, let's say the calling uh, of telling it like it is, and, at, and, and, but at, and, at this, and then living through it, uh, having, having to actually, you know, uh, be part of, uh, be around when the catastrophe occurs. But on the other hand, on the other side of it, you know, we'll, 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 we'll as a church survive on the other side of it as Jeremiah survived on the other side of the destruction of Jerusalem. And then beyond that, even beyond what Jeremiah was able to do, you know, not only can they encourage and not only can they, they help us uh, uh, continue to keep the truth alive, but beyond that, they will have the opportunity literally to be part of the solution. That when Jesus Christ returns, they will be raised to immortal life and then they'll be able to actually not only rebuild this world, but make it, you know, greater than it's ever been, following God's way of life. They'll be part of what we, what you can, what we call the wonderful world tomorrow, the amazing age ahead, the messianic era, the millennium, and then beyond that. And I want to go to Revelation 20 and verse 6. So I think there's a kind of parallel between Jeremiah's career and what he, what he did and the church, although the church will go even beyond that. And Jeremiah will be there. He'll, I believe he'll be resurrected and a part of that. And so we'll be able to work together with Jeremiah and other heroes of the Bible that are resurrected at that time. It's certainly thrilling to look forward to that. And it ought to motivate us to want to stay on that straight and narrow path. I want to go to Revelation 20 and verse 6. Uh, Revelation 20 and verse 6. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power. So as we understand, everybody dies, but some after death are resurrected to immortal life. Now those that are incorrigible, after they are resurrected to judgment, if they are incorrigible, there is a second death from which there is no resurrection. But blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. 
when Jesus Christ returns. Over such the second death has no power. And they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. So as I said, we can do even more than Jeremiah did. <laughs> and, uh, we can share, of course, uh, the millennium with him and many other biblical heroes. And of course, with our elder brother, spiritually speaking, and the husband of the church in terms of that analogy, the returning bridegroom to uh, have the marriage supper of the Lamb. And we can have the opportunity of being kings and priests and judges under King of Kings and Lord of Lords, Jesus Christ, as we walk in the footsteps of Jeremiah. All the best to you and yours.